please be welcome here today at Grace Episcopal Church. Everyone here is a friend and a member of our family, as well as a friend of David. It is good to see all of you here and to welcome you warmly to this table, which is God's table. Just a couple of things to note that um, one of our longtime priests, Bill Harper, is here and will be sharing some thoughts with us today. And we have a number of other folks from the past and present of grace who will be with us to join us in our celebration. Everyone is welcome at the table of Holy Communion. When it's time to come forward to receive communion, please keep your mask on through the duration of that time. So you'll receive some bread, and we ask that you return to your seat and consume the bread at your seat. We will not be serving wine, but we are going around with the chalice. So um, some of you may wish to touch the chalice or in, in some other way observe the chalice as part of your Eucharistic prayer. So when you come forward, you'll receive bread, and you'll encounter the chalice, <laughs> and then you'll return to your place to consume the bread. At the conclusion of our Eucharist, we will then proceed to the memorial garden, and I'll give you a quick instruction then on how to do that. We'll be going out both doors uh, to the rear of this space and gathering above and around the memorial garden to the committal. Again, it's good to have you here. life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors.
Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Doug Pika, and I was a great friend of David's. And on that note, old friends, they shine like diamonds. Old friends, you can always call. Old friends, Lord, you can't buy them. You know it's old friends after all. That's from a song by country singer Chris Stapleton. This past May, on a beautiful spring day, my wife Cassie and I invited Fran to join us along with our granddaughter Clementine for a picnic in Winslow Green here on the island. As Clemmy was enjoying her time running around the grass, we began to eat the fish and chips we had just picked up across the street at Proper Fish. And any of those of you from Bainbridge know those are really good fish and chips. They were all wrapped up in newspaper just as they were always traditionally served in England. Before we started I, <clears throat> eating, I said to Fran, do you remember this, Fran, when you and David and I met in Cambridge, England, at that pub on the River Cam? I said to you, do you remember? That was the summer of 1975. Can you believe it? It was 46 years ago. You said, of course I do. And in the same breath, Fran, you asked me to say a few words here today. You said you have such a history together and we're such good and old friends. I first made, met David when he was a bachelor at his home in Leshy, overlooking Lake Washington. I remember it was June of 1973. That was pre-Fran. <laughs> he and his little bulldog Beulah greeted me at the door that late afternoon. We were introduced to our fraternity, ATO, in which we had both belonged. And at the time, I was still an underclassman in Pullman, and David was working as a volunteer regional advisor in the national fraternity. As the person overseeing all the ATO fraternities in the region, I was told to go meet with David Moen that summer, as we were on a mission to fly to our national convention in Atlanta and adopt a referendum that would help chapters around the country change Hell Week to Help Week practices. That is why and how we met. After we sat down and chatted at his house that first evening together, he asked if I wanted to take a drive around Seattle. As someone who didn't know much about the big city, coming from picking berries that morning at my folks' farm in Puyallup, I enthusiastically said, yes, let's go. And I knew I immediately liked this guy. And Erica and Alyssa, you might find this hard to believe, but your dad was really cool. <laughs> he, he took the two of us in his little MG convertible with the top down in a, on that very warm summer night. Our first destination was Pioneer Square. He gave me an abbreviated story of how Seattle was founded, about Chief South, about Skid Row, the Yeslers, the Denny's, and so on. It was a memorable first visit. By the time David and I went to Atlanta later that summer on my first ever airplane trip, David had met Fran. Not long after that, I had a chance to meet her myself. And Fran, my lasting impression and memory from that meeting was seeing how much the two of you were in love. David was just beaming. He was one happy guy. I remember how I could just feel it. David had other old and lasting friends in his life who, like me, it was a privilege to know. In the past few weeks, I've been able to connect with some of them and hear their messages and loving thoughts about David. It was really fun to connect with them and talk. I'd like to share some of their recollections here with you today. David graduated from the U as an undergraduate in 1962, and before working as a volunteer advisor in his national fraternity when I met him 11 years later, his first job job was with the national fraternity as a chapter service consultant. His job was to travel to campuses around the country and serve as an advisor to those chapters. The national office was located in Champaign, Illinois, where David lived during that time. His old friend of 51 years, Rick Gunn, remembers the first time he met David. Rick was brand new to the job, and David was the most senior person and member of that team. Rick said, it was 1970 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He came right up to me and introduced himself along to others. He was a living legend. He knew so much and so many people. He quickly became a true mentor and lifelong friend to me. Rick came from a family with a history of being employed by and fascinated with trains, <clears throat> and David loved trains. The common interest was one of the things that bonded them together from the get-go. Part of the legend with David is the job 
in the 60s was that he traveled from campus to campus by train. Rick added that he also traveled by trains not only because he loved them, but because it was the more frugal way to go and thus save the fraternity um, money. After David passed, Rick was moved that Fran sent him a stash of magazines on trains that David saved for Rick, including little notes that David had written and attached. David wanted Rick to have them. That was just like him, Rick said. That gesture was so considerate and so thoughtful, it touched my heart. When David left the position in Champaign, he moved back to the Northwest, where he went to work for the phone company in downtown Seattle. During part of his time there in the 80s and 90s, David and I were both commuting together to <clears throat> Seattle on the ferry boat. Oftentimes, I would drive him to work from the boat once we reached Seattle, where I had a car. The building in downtown where he worked was referred to as the Ma Bell Building, located between 8th and Terry. One time when I dropped him off, he asked if I wanted to come in and see his office and just look around. There was one thing that stood out for me that visit. Everything, and I mean everything, was painted Ma Bell Baby Blue. <laughs> Fast forward to about seven years later, I called David to tell him that my employer, Seattle Children's, had purchased that building. I was excited to tell him this because this is where we would be conducting research to save lives and create better treatments for kids. I knew how much that would mean to him. I still think of David when I see that building today. One of David's early colleagues at the phone company in the 70s and 80s was Daryl Haug. Daryl and David became close friends during David's 25 years with the company. David and Fran and Daryl and his wife Nancy also became couple friends as they were each married within a month of each other in December of 1974. As Daryl described it, we grew up together in our marriages. David loved to ski, which was something both he and Daryl shared and took great pleasure in. They especially enjoyed the annual skiing trip to Colorado near Fran's parents in Winter Park. He told me one story where he and David tried to set a record for themselves on how many vertical feet they could ski in one day. Once they made it to 25,000 feet, which, as Daryl pointed out, was like skiing Mount Rainier and Mount Baker, top to bottom in one day. It was one of their shared great highlights and memories together. Daryl noted that his friend David touched so many people's lives, how loyal he was as a friend and always there for you. He said, we could go without speaking to each other for months and then just pick up where we left off once we saw each other again. Besides his loving family, perhaps David's greatest legacy is how much he gave back to others. David was the embodiment of what it means to be a servant leader. His strong desire to serve and help others took a turn when he accepted early retirement from the phone company and began what would become a second career in the fundraising development work. His longtime friend and colleague, John Hamroff, told me a story when his board member at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center called one, one day and asked if John would be willing to meet with David. His board member was also the CEO from the phone company. Of course, John agreed to such a meeting, but he was thinking, oh great, here's this guy who knows nothing about our field and I'm supposed to meet with him and find him a job. John was then the head of development at the Hutch. John dutifully scheduled a 20 to 30 minute meeting with David and over an hour later, they were still talking before the meeting broke up. Dave and I just clicked, he said. Not only did I think he'd be a great fundraiser, but I knew I wanted to be this guy's friend. John and David went on to work together at the Hutch and later as consultants in two with other nonprofits. John said of him, what made David so adept at his work was his ability to engage and listen to people. John's wife, Sherry, added his ego did not precede him into the room. Both she and John said of David that he was kind, open with people, and modestly confident. Your time together with him left a lasting impression. You could trust him. In addition to those organizations David worked for in his career, the list of not-for-profits in which he volunteered were numerous. For example, there was the Heifer International and the YMCA of the Rockies, just to list a couple. And of course, he was a volunteer throughout his steadfast work in the church. Bob Hawkins was a lifetime friend of David's through St. Mark's in Seattle. David was a parishioner there before moving to Bainbridge. Bob recalls how valuable David was to the church and their time together there. One of the outgrowths of his volunteer efforts at St. Mark's was serving as a mentor and coach in the formation of Earth Ministries. His work in the church continued when he and Fran moved to Bainbridge Island 
<clears throat> it started at St. Barnabas, Barnabas, and from there, he and Fran both provided key leadership and inspirational roles in the formation of Grace, this church. David's skill and contribution to the church was especially felt with all of the church's financial matters. He was the ultimate good steward of the plate. He would always like to say, a church has a right to expect sound management. In whatever financial situation we found ourselves, I always felt as a fellow parishioner, we would be all right if I knew David was involved. In all of these various organizations and capacities, he was always willing to step up and do whatever tasks needed to be done. There was nothing too small and no leadership position too big that he, which he wasn't willing to say yes if he thought it was necessary. His spirit and acts of generosity were boundless. David also understood the importance of giving back to the community in which is in your own backyard. In 2001, David became a founding board member of the Bainbridge Island Community Foundation. He rejoined the board in 2016 and was active there for the next few years. Jim Hopper, the foundation's executive de director, got to know David through David's longtime friend, Kate Webster. And Kate had said to Jim, you should really speak with David Moen. Jim wisely took her advice, and soon David and he were working together. Jim said of David, he exemplified the term gentleman. He was an experienced development professional where trust and integrity were his hallmarks. What both Jim and John understood about David is that David was always motivated by an organization's mission. It was never about himself. The mission always came first. It's a quality of David's <clears throat> that stood out and defined who he was and what he stood for. I too love that about him. Before moving to Bainbridge Island, David and Fran lived in a beautiful Queen Anne neighborhood overlooking downtown Seattle. As newlyweds, Cassie and I lived in a small condo not too far away. On the 30th birthday, I was thrown a surprise birthday party with friends on a cruise boat around Elliott Bay. That was way back in 1982. Of course, David and Fran were on that boat. And on that cruise, David and Fran came over to us and said, guess what? We're moving to Bainbridge Island. We just bought a house. They were hoping the boat would go by so they could point it out, and it did. This beautiful yellow craftsman home on Euclid Avenue, sitting above the, the bank in Port Madison. Fran, you and David were so excited that evening for what your future was with your new home and your new community. Not long after that, we followed David and Fran and moved there. They introduced us to the island and what would become some of our dear and mutual friends. Some were fellow parishioners at St. Barnabas. As active parishioners, they eagerly invited us to join them to become members, which we happily did. One of those couples we met through their introduction were their friends Dick and Julie Shryock. I asked Julie recently if there was any moment or incident in their relationship with David that either formed an impression or left a lasting memory. And almost before I could finish, Julie said, yes, it was at St. Barnabas sometime in the mid 80s. Julie said they were at some meeting where he would be where it would be decided who would be the senior warden and who would be the junior warden. Julie was feeling there were others in the room who may be more experienced to lead the church as senior warden and thus suggested she perhaps should be the junior warden, but the group felt otherwise. She said, then she caught David's eye and he said to her with that little twinkle in his eye, you can do this, and she did. I especially love that story, you can do this, just like you can do this, Erica. You can do this, Erica. You can live on your own in Caracas, Venezuela over the next three years. <clears throat> or you can do this, Alyssa. You can go off to Paraguay for the next two years with the Peace Corps. That was so David, that quality, that encouragement, the support, the nudge he gave all of us. The faith he had in you, his coaching, his mentoring, all of that was him to the core. Our families grew up together here on the island. Our daughter Allie said of David how very proud he was of his two daughters and how very happy Erica and Alyssa were to just hang around with their dad. She said what a reliable anchor he was to her in her life, someone who was always there for you. And she added, would listen and respond to you without judgment. Our son Ted said something similar by adding, he took a genuine interest in all of our lives and with a slight smile on his face added, down to the last detail. 
And he said, that's just because he cared. We loved David and David loved all of us. Along with Allie and Teddy, he loved his god godson Joe and our youngest son Sam and now all of their families. He attended many of those special milestone events, including Allie's wedding in English in the English Cotswolds in October before COVID. David would not be denied doing what was important to him by any physical limitations. That said so much about him and Fran. I think that was his Norwegian, just part of his Norwegian DNA. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Stephen Sondheim and he wrote a wonderful musical, Merrily We Rolled Along, and wrote about being blessed with old friends. He wrote, old friends do not tend to become old habits. I never knew how much I missed you till now. It's been almost a year and a half since David passed, and like all of you, we miss him. I miss him. Each of us will keep our own memories of time together with David. In closing, let me share you one of ours. The Picas will always cherish our annual Christmas Eve dinner with the Moans, which has always included sharing our mutual Norwegian heritage. Every year, David would come dressed to the nines in his Dale Norway sweater, and Fran would come with her Kumkaka or her Yule log. So today, Fran and Erica and Alyssa, one of those of us who are up here speaking with you to present some memento we could bring to the altar that symbolized something of David's life. So what I'm about to show you is in memory of David. It is, as Fran said, something he wore proudly and added for which he loved the attention. They signify the importance of his Norwegian heritage and the joy he had in sharing it with others. Shorts <laughs> from Norway. Here's to our friend David. Good afternoon. I am Mary Lynn, Franny's younger sister. I point that out not because we have any other sisters, uh, but we look so much alike, we've been told, we sound alike, we have same mannerisms. I thought the distinction of my being younger might help you. <laughs> After his recent stroke, sweet David was confused at time as to who was in the room helping him. So Franny and I would both get into the room and stand side by side to help straighten out the confusion that he was feeling about the identities of these sisters. In preparation for this eulogy, I reached out to our family and asked from descriptors of David that they knew. The list is plentiful as well as meaningful, and I encourage you to listen to these adjectives and take a moment to reflect on those things that perhaps bring to your mind an exchange or a moment you shared with David. Affable, unflappable, hashtag girl's dad. Great laugh, contagious smile, pleasant to be around, adventurous, welcoming, warm, compassionate, quick sense of humor, kind, generous with his time, talent, tithe, supportive, appreciative, cheerful, genial, principled, moral, loving, intent listener, inclusive, particularly so to include others in a joke, attentive, thoughtful, intelligent, witty, great at asking questions without judgment, and a knack of paraphrasing and reflecting, a genuine man. While my eulogy will not include all the heartwarming details offered along with these adjectives, I would like to offer a reflection on one in particular, unflappable. Several people offer that descriptor, and I am able to validate that by a quote from Franny, who once was describing to me a discovery of something she thought was totally amazing. At the time, she wrote, I of course was shrieking with delight and David was taking this all in stride, as was his way. 
So many commented on David's calm, unflappable demeanor, being a source of comfort and confidence to them. Truth be known, I believe it might have been one of the strong points within the label, hashtag girl dad. And I know it is one of the things his beloved daughters, Erica and Melissa, depended on when it was time to call, time to talk things over, to lean on dad. On the other hand, I am able to offer a time when David Stride was a little bit shaken. It occurred one winter's night at Christmas time when in their car, Franny, David, one of their girls, and one of my stepsons were headed over snowy, icy, dark, Snoqualmie Pass to Fred's in my home in Eastern Oregon. Many of us can relate to the intensity of nighttime, snowy, icy driving, driver and passengers all silent and perhaps a little tense. Ever vigilant in the back seat was Franny, number one back seat driver. <laughs> keeping her eyes on the driver, David, should he have any signs of fatigue, when suddenly she was just sure David was nodding off. He wasn't, he was just stretching his tense neck. In spite of, Franny yelled, David! From the stories told by the other two passengers upon their arrival at our home, one might say David was flapped. <laughs> Now, David never really wanted anything in which he was involved to be about him. However, today is about David, and we do want to remember as he was among us and to remember David's spirit as the memories of him bless our lives and remain in our hearts. He would be very pleased a suggestion made a while back for Memorial Garden at Grace has come to fruition. David had a history of supporting his friends and helping make connections for them as well. As a matter of fact, Franny would like to acknowledge today a memorial service is being held in California for a lifelong friend who was a fraternity brother and a housemate of David's, Merle Hufford. It was David who was the matchmaker for Merle and his wife, Vicki. It happened that Merle passed away just a few months after David. Merle's health had been a concern for quite a while and was seemingly to decline rather rapidly. After David's stroke, during one of the last phone conversations they had, Merle said to David, how you doing, pal? And with his quick, amazing sense of humor, even then, David said, well, Merle, I'm not sure, but I think I'm catching down to you. <laughs> Although David didn't introduce me to my husband, Fred, it was David's wisdom and counsel that sealed the deal for me to say yes to marriage. Not being sure I could ever have the good fortune to have the kind of marriage my parents had and Fran and David had, I shared with David I was hesitant. He simply said to me, take your helmet off. <laughs> Similar sage advice was given to Eric and Alyssa, to whom at some point in the young adult lives, he said marriage is hard work. Do not settle. We each listened, and all with happy marriages, we are all grateful we took his advice. Now, to illustrate the strong influence David has in our family, I want to share how we say goodnight to one another most nights. There is a lengthy explanation, but suffice it to say, originally it is from a children's song. And after it was first said to David by his sister Marilyn and her husband Mac, he continued it with his family and then with our family. We happily reciprocated. We say, nighty noodles. <laughs> we have said it not only to our immediate families, but to our extended families and sometimes to guests in our home for as long as I can remember. It has become such a natural thing to say that my husband accidentally ended a late night business call with his executive <laughs> officer <laughs> saying nighty noodles. There was no reciprocal response on the other end, so we can safely say it has not spread through the U.S. Army. However, we do continue to end our days this way, and now it will be with a nod to David, thanking him and remembering him for the loving influence he continues to have on our family. I do want to share throughout the trial and tribulation of the last months, my dear brother-in-law was as thoughtful and appreciative as always. Minus the hours the stroke was complicated and overpowered him, David was ready with a squeeze of the hand and a thank you. And when it came time to acknowledge the love of his life, 
David gave Franny that special eye blink that they shared between them and a sweet little kiss. May I say for this exchange, he always picked the right sister. <laughs> the one with whom he fell in love on the day they met over 46 years ago gone and forever in love. The work had been worth it. And now is one of the three mementos chosen by Franny, Erica, and Alyssa, commemorating important parts of David's life. There's a travel bag presented. It signifies David's love of planning trips for the whole family. And now I'm going to go back to the page I omitted and tell you about this love of travel. I was thinking this was really short and I must miss something, and I did. David first appeared in our family's life in 1973. After only a month of having met, Franny arrived in Colorado to our parents' home with David to share their plans to be married. My parents knew this fellow must be something special even before they arrived as he made the plans for the trip to Colorado, not Fran Marie. That was very different from our perspective because she was known to us as the happy wanderer. Until then, no one could keep up. David loved to travel. Thanks to our sisters-in-law, slip of the tongue, David ended up with the label Plip Tranner, a spoonerism for trip planner. She was so thoroughly impressed with David's ability, she announced to him, you are a great Plip Tranner. And the family all agreed, and Plip Tranner he was from then on. He always looked forward to planning a trip and getting the details on the calendar. Those details would include the most amazing finds. In addition to great planning, David had the touch of using accumulated airline miles, finding bargains on ticket prices, accommodations, cars. It always seemed that they could take these wonderful journeys for half the cost it was to the rest of us. Back in my 20s, there was a book entitled Europe on $5 a day. David could have authored that then and now. As soon as one trip was planned, another was in the hopper, being considered. Had the stroke not occurred, David had plans in the works for a trip to Newfoundland to visit a Middleton cousin and her family on a new assignment. A truth be known, trips were being planned to the end. David's mind was truly focused on being prepared to go somewhere as his conversations with us implied. For David, the planning was an integral part of the fun. It mattered not the season nor the transportation. He enjoyed researching potential destinations, chatting with those who might have insights to be considered, and discovering with whom they could connect along the way. One of his favorite sayings was, if not now, when? It was either David through friends or folks David and Franny would meet along the way, particularly while attending local church services wherever they found themselves, that these connections were made. Being a coffee aficionado, coffee hour aficionado, David had a gift for meeting people and making friends, striking up conversations which led to future visits around the world. He reciprocated by making sure Madrona Drive, Northeast Bainbridge Island was on their acquaintance's radar. It was probably David's ability to listen and reflect thoughtfully that endeared those in his path to him. Recall it was said about him, he was warm, welcoming, and intent listener. One of his nieces shared, he had a knack for paraphrasing and reflecting in a way that helped me hear my own story with a fresh perspective. And if any of you who have ever had a conversation with David heard, and how's that working for you? <laughs> you knew right away a fresh perspective on your own story might be a good idea. Totally up to you, however, David's questions were based solely on his interest in you. There was never any judgment, always genuine support. And now I will go back to say to you that as one of the mementos chosen by Franny, Erica, and Alyssa, commemorating important parts of David's life, I present the travel bag, and it signifies the love of planning trips for the whole family. In the satchel, one might find plane tickets, boat tickets, bus tickets, and best yet, according to David, train tickets, itineraries, passports, etc. And to all, he would offer this sage advice, pack wisely, you pack it, you carry it. It is now a family mantra and a great metaphor for life. Another bit of lasting wisdom for a beloved Plip Tranner. A husband, a dad, a father-in-law, a grandpa, a brother-in-law, an uncle, friend. Dave, David, David Harrison Moen, a genuine man.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother David. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. The word of the Lord. Please join me in saying the psalm responsively. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, O Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And then Jesus said to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier of our lives. Amen. You may be seated. Hmm. Uncharacteristically, I have notes. I have notes to remind me of the obvious and to help me say less. Because there is so much good that could be said. I want to start with thank you. Fran, Alyssa, Erica. Thank you for time spent together. Thank you for trusting me to stand in this particular place. I need to say thank you to Doug and Mary Lynn for, oh, just filling us with vision and memory. I believe in eternal life, and I believe in resurrection, simply because of what you two said. Because David was alive and well as he spoke, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Stephen, thank you for sharing space and place with me. Um, We talked about this earlier. Um, This is what David did. He brought people together, made connection. And if it weren't for David Mullen's life, David's death and David's resurrection, we would not have this connection that we have now. I'm grateful. This is what David lived for. This, that's happening right now. This is what David Moen lived for. And this service is David's gift to us. From time to time may have felt like a burden. There were a lot of notes. Very, very specific instructions for all of us. The the trip planning extended to liturgical planning. It's taken some time to be able to unwrap this gift, which in some ways has caused all of us to savor it in particular ways, like the gifts that we give one another, how we delight in the time in between the creating of the gift and the time that the receiver gets to open it. So we've been looking at this gift, and here it is. We are unwrapping it. And when I say that David gave this gift to us, there is literally every part of this service today, except maybe one song, scripted by David Moen. And I see him doing that. I see him delighting in picking pieces and parts over time, preparing for this particular day, which is not a day that most folk are comfortable preparing for. But I see him taking delight in it as he imagined the people who would be present. As he imagined people taking delight in one another. As he imagined smiles and tears, connections being made again. I could see that smile across his face as he would piece this together. So we may have come here to thank God and to praise David Moen, and we have, But David Mullen would then deflect. It's not about me. Yes, it is, David. (laughs) Today, it's about you. But again, that gift and tendency of his to deflect away and point to others. No, it was her and her and her and them. It was all these other people around me. The truth is that 
no part of this service, at least as I was thinking about it, is more reflective of his planning and his hope and his vision than in the gospel lesson that we just heard. Let's spend a moment with that gospel. In that part of John's story of the life of Jesus, Jesus is getting his friends ready for the end, for his death. So it is the beginning of an end. And he gathers them together in many different ways, and he says long things to them. But in this particular case, in this particular story, it's very short and sweet. I'm going away. Don't worry. I'm going to a place that has been prepared for me and prepared for you. Thomas, as we heard, said, no, we don't know where you're going. Which I think was a characteristic of the followers of Jesus over and over again. We do not know where you are going, but we're going to continue to follow. We do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And what's been happening to me with this story, as I've thought about David piecing this together, is I see David in the background of that group of followers, those disciples, those friends of Jesus. I see him right on the periphery on the edge with a little wink and that smile looking at Jesus and David simply saying, oh, I know. I know where you're going. There is a place. That is the David Moen story. I'm preparing a place for you. Here's a place for you. Here, come and see what we've done for you. You sit in this building now as we gather here. Come and see what I've done for you. There is a place for you. Welcome to it. David spent his life preparing a place and making room for other people. And we've heard those stories over and over again. And one of the great things that he would do when he would put me into conversation with someone else, oh, you two should meet. Let me bring you together here. You'd start talking. David would be standing there. And then he'd just move away and let you have the relationship. Here, let me show you the place where you belong. I suppose there's no better way to follow Jesus than simply to do that over and over again with a whole life. Let me show you where you belong. David was a shepherd. He was, and I say this as a pastor, David was a pastor. He would shepherd people along to the place where they belonged, even if they didn't know that there was a place where they belonged. He was so supportive to pastors, was deep in his heart to care about pastors, to care about clergy, which is why I can look around the room and see so many of us <laughs> clergy who want to be here to remember him. He often pastored us. He loved the church. Doug, thank you for talking about that. He loved the church without being sentimental about it. He didn't romanticize it. He understood life and community in the church can be a challenge. But I know personally, I know personally that I could not have been a pastor without his pastoral care, without the way he extended it to me. We have been remembering through symbols there was a particular, hmm, particular award given at St. Mark's where David and Fran were members together before they came to Bainbridge Island. Um, created and given by the particular dean of St. Mark's at that time, Gabby Tennis, who's now bishop, now retired bishop. Gabby, I'm so grateful to see you here today because I knew that this was part of the symbol um, of David's faithfulness. Clergy, communities, churches recognized in him the gift that he had to be a pastor to care for others. Um, so this award um, 
is part of what we remember. There's a very simple story I have that I want to tell that this reminds me of. Um, more than 30 years ago when I was ordained a deacon, uh, Cabby, you preached the sermon. You should not need to remember that. I should need to remember that. Um, and it's a story that reminded me of David that you told, uh, a cartoon story, um, a little comic strip called Kudzu. Some of us may remember that. Um, the young boy who's looking for advice goes to his pastor and says, I don't know how you do it. The burdens of the world all on you. Having to explain intricate details of God and the universe. How do you do it? How do you sustain it? How do you keep yourself going? And the pastor looks at the young boy and says, yeah, I don't go out much. <laughs> David's gift was that he went out all the time to the people around him. So this gospel lesson makes so much sense to me and I'm grateful to David for the gift that he has given us. His humility, his tenacious humility, as we talked about it, his humility, his generosity, oh gosh, man, his deep love for you as his partner, Eric and Alyssa, the joy that he felt in you all of the time, the delight in your independence, your strength, the way his eyes would open and shine as he talked about you. All of that, all of those qualities that we know about him are rooted in this particular gospel story. And in this very way, David could trust. He trusted that there was a place. In hearing those words, David knew that, well, that's settled. Good. Let's get on with getting there. No doubt. No need to worry about it. He could trust. Because he could trust, he was not afraid. He was not afraid of the world around him. He was not afraid to be vulnerable. He's not afraid to love his people and let his people go. To live without fear in the world that we live in is a hard thing to do. So I'm grateful today, as I think we all are, for this story that David have, has given us and the way he has embodied it in his life. So I started with gratitude and I'll end with gratitude that David lived out the story of his faith in trust and without fear. Let's join together in following in his footsteps. Now you know that there is a way and a place prepared for you. David is deflecting from him and pointing in that direction. Go this way. Come with me, he says. There's a place for you. Thank you, David Moen, and thank you to the God of David Moen. Because of David and his embodiment of that faith, we know that there is a place where we belong to. Amen. In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Loving God, we pray for David's family, friends, and for all who have been touched by the grace of his life, that they and we may know the comfort of your love. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray that you may use us as bearers of your love to support one another. We remember today all those who suffer grief or loss in any form. Hear our prayer. Give us both patience and faith after this time of loss that we may come to understand the wonder of your mercy and the mystery of your love. Lord, hear our prayer. Increase our faith and trust in you and in the powers of life that we may live our lives with courage and hope for the future. Lord, hear our prayer. Give us such a vision of your purpose and such an assurance of your power and love that we may know the grace that is always ours through you. Lord, hear our prayer. In our grief, draw us into your presence where we may be still and know that you are God. Show us your peace and your goodness. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. so I try folded it. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, wind, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart. and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ, crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ, given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints, from every tribe and language and people and nation, to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as 
we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love you have fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. Grant that this sacrament may be to us a comfort in affliction and a pledge of our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant David with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of all, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so you ordained when you created us, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant David with your saints. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant David. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. At this time, we will proceed to the Memorial Garden 
led by the cross. So we will commit David's ashes to the ground. You are invited to come with us to follow the family out either door. You can gather down and around the garden, or you can stay up above where you can actually see a little bit better. And it might be more convenient for some of you. So we'll now proceed forth. Everyone the Father gives to me will come to me. I will never turn away anyone who believes in me. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give new life to our mortal bodies through his indwelling spirit. My heart, therefore, is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And in your right hand are pleasures forevermore.
in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend our brother David to Almighty God, and we commit his body to this resting place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face to shine upon him and be gracious to him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. This mic is for the people on Zoom. <laughs> so I'm going to shout a little bit. Uh, before I say these prayers, I just want to thank all of you who have come today. It is just such an honor to us that you are sharing this day with us. Um, it, it, um, it makes our hearts really, really full. I want to acknowledge in particular two people, my sons-in-law, um, Harrison and Raul, who asked for the privilege to prepare this site, to dig this hole for these remains. And to me, to have these young men in my life is just such, such an honor. And I'm going to change this prayer just a little bit. My friend Julie has reminded me that it's important to continue to say the name of a person who has died. So in your response, I would appreciate it if you would say, we remember David. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember David. In the glowing of the wind and in the chill of the winter, we remember David. In the opening of buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember David. In the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of the summer, we remember David. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of the autumn, we remember David. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember David. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember David. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember David. When we have joys that we yearn to share, we remember David. So as long as we live, he too shall live, for he is now part of us as we remember David. Amen. Amen. Rest eternal grant to David, O Lord. That will shine upon him. And it may David's soul and the souls of all the departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. And now may the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah and of Jesus, born of our sister Mary, and of the Holy Spirit who broods over creation like a mother over her children. Be upon us and remain with us forever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Oh Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching. Begins to rise when the sun begins to shine. Oh Lord, I want to be in that number. When the sun begins to shine.